Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm going to take you through a quick presentation on two examples of Herculean architecture from two continents. This is going to be part of an ongoing series on Gnostic currents, uh, which will be exploring um, our past, our humanity's past, and why the relative silence about these structures in mainstream academia. Uh, it, it is very. Uh, it has been a very annoying thing to see through the 20th century. Uh, many mainstream archaeologists, historians, and so on, not want to talk about the ancients and ancient civilizations and the history. Well, the um, the huge time discrepancies we see in some of these. Um, these temple sites and complexes around the world. Uh, so let's have a look at what we can find here. Uh, the distinguished scholars in this field, we have Richard Cassaro. Um, he's been on television quite a few times. You might know him. Uh, he's uh, a great author, uh, researcher, Freemason, actually, uh, as well, and someone who's done a, a lot of work um, building a fairly decent picture of this, uh, and actually putting forward some new ideas uh, in this field. We have Brian Forrester and this fella is very interesting because he goes, he has a YouTube channel himself and he goes around many of these temple corp complexes um, with a camera and conducts essentially what it, what it tours uh, that you can uh, go on from the comfort of your own living room. Uh, he's a very hands-on um, adventurer, like an Indiana Jones type, really, and he's done so many of these uh, expeditions to these places now. He's many, many tens and tens and tens of times. He has been to one of the complexes, we, we, the first complex we're going to be you know, detailing here, about over 50 times. So he's certainly does this for a living and a lot of the work he um, has done over the years has certainly piqued my interest and I'm sure it will pique yours as we go forward. Uh, Graham Hancock, uh, the inestimable Graham Hancock, a great author in this subject. He used to be, a, he's an English fella, he used to be a journalist for The Economist uh, many decades back, um, but now he does uh, he talks about ancient civilizations and alternative human origins and so on. Uh, great research, really good. Uh, Robert Seppa, another individual who has a really um, large YouTube channel with lots and lots of content. Great research, uh, certainly worth checking out. Uh, David Hatcher Childress, uh, another author. Uh, he's appeared many times on television and um, ancient aliens and so on as well. He is more on the um, you know, on that side of the field when it comes to these su this subject, um, and I I have sympathy for that position. Honestly, I'm, I've not made up my mind entirely yet exactly what we're looking at, but uh, he's a he's a good good guy, and I've got one of his books, and it is very interesting. And also Robert Shock, now he's uh, done a ton of work on the Sphinx. Uh, he's a geologist, he's a professor, and his work has been invaluable um, because I mean, him being a geologist, he's able to rather accurately date um, a lot of these stoneworks. And he was one of the fellas who um, was able to correctly identify that there is a significant water weathering on the Sphinx. Now we're not going to be looking at Egypt today, I wanted to do something a little different and there are so many sites across the globe that have these Herculean, um, Atlantean, like Cyclopean ruins. I thought I'd, uh, I thought it would benefit you to, to look at a couple of sites that you might not have heard of. So, a stupendous megalithic architecture, let's have a look what we can find here. Pumapunku. Uh, part of the Tiawanaka complex in Bolivia, and here we'll find some uh, andesite structures here. These H blocks are quite um, important um, and quite uh, iconic 
in this in this realm. Here we go again. We can see more here. Uh, this is 13,000 uh, feet uh, above sea level. This site. That's uh, red sandstone and andesite structures that you'll find here. Andesite is a very hard igneous rock. By the way, uh, uh, archaeologists insist that Bronze Age tools were used to fashion these. And this is problematic. The H blocks featured uh, above appear individually crafted as they are not uh, completely identical in size and they appear not to have been made in moulds. They seem to fit like complex Lego pieces. But if we take the examples above as female, there are no male blocks anywhere to be found. And again, this is anomalous, it's very strange. Where did they come from? How long ago were they made? Um, the Tionakan people uh, referenced these many times and said that they were just here, laying around when we uh, got to these sites. Um, very strange. The fit and finish of the masonry, uh, the various masonry is stunning. Its sandstones appear far more eroded than others. Uh, uh, now here's the famous sun gate at Tiwanaku and you're going to find a lot of very substantial blocks of stone as well. Uh, some of the megalithic blocks at this site are way more than 100 tons. Notable is that no trees exist at this altitude which leaves archaeologists in a bind regarding how exactly they got here or there. Uh, the red sandstone blocks at this site are from a quarry approximately eight miles away. The grey sand, uh, sorry, the grey stone is andesite and the volcano it comes from is located around 55 miles from the site. This is a volcanic, uh, the um, result of a volcanic eruption and the quarry, yeah, 55 miles away guys. This leaves people in a bind as to exactly how they got here um, if you're going to use trees that don't seem to exist uh, anywhere close to this site um, and the, the stones the weight of the stones is often going to be uh, such a size that they will well they'll cause a lot of trouble to the, the rollers uh, and they can often go splat and end up not working very well Okay, and yeah, this is an aerial view of Pumapunku. You can see it was some kind of temple structure, which is what they think. It's a palace behind. Um, and here again, we'll find these. This is going to be andesite. You can see the distinction here between the red sandstone and the andesite. Sandstone is uh, easier to fashion. Uh, here, the type of masonry at this site does not or do not match any other ancient structures on this continent as well. Again, anomalous stuff, making it very interesting for scholars in this field and, you know, hard, hard to, to think about. How did this happen? Um, there is evidence that some of the stones uh, have been blasted by extreme heat, creating vitrified glass. Possible explanations could be heat from an asteroid impact or a solar coronal event. Uh, scholars such as Robert Schock have speculated, and this would uh, also be able to. We can now reasonably, in a reasonably assured way, date this site, and um, because of these, this sun blasting. Now, this is obviously Robert Schock's uh, perspective. There may well have been, this may well have been the result as well of a comet impact. Um, it might have been off of the uh, coast of uh, Iceland. Uh, and it does appear about something like 9,800 BC there was a comet impact and it completely destroyed northern america wiping out all of its major megafauna and creating conditions which completely destroyed any larger cultures in north america and it, it was certainly felt in uh, in europe as well this is a huge and cataclysmic event and it's certainly now uh it's a sound um not just a theory, uh, but it certainly did happen. And we only found this out a few, just a few years ago. Uh, 
if you look into the work of Graham Hancock, he details this in at least a couple of his books. Here's the sun gate again, and this uh, sun gate was around uh, 11 tons, this gate here, and has on it ancient, it was cut from one piece of stone originally, um, it's now been cracked, and has on it ancient artwork, Richard Cassaro calls the God Self icon. And what is seriously cool is that this icon is ubiquitous in ancient megalithic and other archaeological sites, leading many to believe that an extremely adept and advanced parent culture had a hand in building temple structures and assorted megaliths across four continents. Here it is. You'll find this in Africa as well as Asia. And here are some other places you'll find this. God self icon and it is a very old icon. You, you see it's in China and Lebanon. You can go on and, and it was obviously extremely um, prevalent. Let's have a look again. Okay, and just getting used to using this, so forgive me. Uh, here again we see some of the sound of sight. Extremely strange carvings um, in some of these blocks. Very hard to do with Bronze Age tools. I mean, you'd have to change the tool every few uh, chiselings because it would just wear down or break. Why would, what would you really use a Bronze Age tool to make this? What would be the purpose? There must have been something else uh, uh, in use here. More examples of this high precision and proficiency um, in the stone cutting. Grey andesite on the left, red on the right. Um, uh, andesite, of course, measures a seven on the Moore's scale, just a little harder than granite and extremely hard rock to fashion using Bronze Age tools, as I just uh, explained. A couple of points to finish. The largest block at Tiwanaku weighs around 130 tons, and some of the archaeology and stonework can quite reliably and comfortably uh, be dated to 12,000 years ago. Um, though mainstream uh, archaeologists hate talking about this, they often just will not go here. Uh, now for a bit of fun. Eddie Hall, this beast of nature, it's called the beast, here he is again, uh, now this fella recently broke the world record for a deadlift, 500 kilograms, just under 500 kilograms actually, and uh, he was able just to lift this and then put it down, this is half of a ton, and he is a freak of nature, honestly, this is the first time this has ever been done as far as we know, and yeah, just think about that for a, for a moment. 130 tons and routinely tons and tons of stonework taken many miles from quarries around Tiwanaku. And here we have this fellow only able to lift half a ton. What's going on here? That's just, just for a little um, perspective. Now we are going to move to Bulbac. And here we have uh, three, there are three temple complexes here. Uh, it's a very large salvage, beautiful salvage. We've been here, Bulbeck, Lebanon, hosts the largest temple site attributed to the Romans within the historic empire. It is a huge uh, site, contains three temples one to Jupiter on the left, one to Bacchus, middle, and the third is to Venus. And the, the Venus temple is unfortunately being largely destroyed. And here's one of the columns. Brace yourselves, guys, because we're just about to see the biggest um, cut rock that is in any piece of architecture in the world. And here are some of the other stones as well. This fella in yellow. It's been highlighted here, it's sitting in front of the blocks of stones that weigh 350 tons apiece, and there are bigger stones as well. Bulbeck sports the largest stone blocks ever to be cut, moved and used in any construction anywhere in the world. The three trillers thorn blocks underneath the temple Jupiter are truly epic, and you can see them actually on the top left. They are above the uh, other stones here, which also look absolutely monumental. 
when you, uh, sorry, a way in excess of 800 tons a piece, they sit atop blocks that are around 300 uh, tons a piece. Uh, we don't like uh, we, sorry, we don't build like this today for obvious reasons. The logistics of this stuff would just be too much to, to handle for most builders. Why would you bother? Now, uh, here we have the quarry down the road from where these stones were taken. This is just over a kilometre away. Uh, and we see here the quarry used to sort of stones was found along. Uh, with these monoliths uh, which were left in the quarry, evidently just a tad too heavy, just about to find out why to work with. Uh, one of these stones weighs around 1,650 tons. Uh, what's interesting about this site, among many other things, is that the triathlon stones are placed upon other stones at a height of 10 meters. So they were hoisted up, they were lifted. What's more, the quarry they were taken from is over a kilometre away, uh, and the surrounding landscape is hilly. This is most likely not Roman architecture, and we're just about to find out why. The quarry from where the blocks were cut is downhill from the temple site, and logs would simply split, they would just be crushed, they would go splat. Uh, under this weight, you can use around 800 oxes hypothetically to move a triathlon block, but this again is foolish thinking as organizing and then expecting all of these oxes to work in tandem here in, in perfect unison would, uh, with said wooden rollers not buckling, would be a simply impossible task. You can't get oxes to do what you want them to do on a good day. Uh, they're not particularly well, um, they're not horses, you know. Um, so the strongest crane as well the Romans ever used in any construction in the whole of the empire's existence, the polystyrene crane could only lift... Oh, there's one. <laughs> Okay, uh, the Romans used... Yeah, this, I apologise for this. You, the Romans used uh, to drill... Uh, you, uh, Lewis holes in order to hoist large blocks as well. There are no Lewis holes in these blocks, so you, they used to tap in holes to be, to secure the blocks, uh, which enabled them to lift them. You don't see any of these Lewis holes in the trilithon blocks. Uh, and yes, yeah, 6.6 .6 tons. And I've actually looked online, uh, and you, often you'll find that. Um, uh, there are many people who say they could only lift about three tons. Uh, this is an absolute uh, maximum hold uh, weight that they, they would have been able to use here. Uh, 53 tons is the largest stone block as well the Romans ever fashioned and maneuvered and it was the Trajan's column and it was impressive in its own right of course but 53 tons is not 800 tons, three times all lined perfectly flush to each other. It's strange also that the most stunning and jaw-dropping jaw architectural feats the Romans could ever conduct, would ever conduct, would be in the Lebanon and not in the Empire's great capital as well. Uh, important little factoid. Conclusions. Richard Cassari's work shows a supremely important synergy in the construction methods and layout, comparative mythology, similar artwork, conical head binding as well, and even burial rituals. They all seem common to this some uh, this parent culture. Um, they seem to pres uh, betray sorry the presence of a root culture and play here. Um, the two examples of sites on two continents given here are but a tiny sample of this mythic but very real past. The awe and breathtaking sophistication of these Atlantean or Cyclopean peoples, as some call them. Again, I apologise for the grammar. Now, this is a swastika found at Pumapunku. I know the, uh, through the 20th century, the, this um, image here, this symbol took on a very, very grim form indeed, but it, it wasn't the way with our ancient um, forebears. And this swastika is ubiquitous in uh, many of these cultures. And here it is at Bel Bulbeck as well. It's, these are identical uh, symbols. And here are some more of these swastikas found 
all over the place. This one, of course, the third one here is in Asia. This is a Buddhist symbol. Here we go again. You can see it in the in Middle East as well. And here are some of the places you'll find the swastika. Uh, and yeah, something to think about, guys. Uh, thanks to the brilliant work of the researchers and scholars referenced here. And please take a look at some of their work if you're interested. And um, thank you very much as well to all the people I shamelessly uh, pillaged these, uh, pi uh, these photos from. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for making it through to this point. And have a great day. Thank you very much.